So again, we've already covered Coulomb's law. We've already started talking about electric fields and how to calculate electric fields. What we're doing today is going back and doing the first lesson of this unit, which in video format wouldn't translate very well. That being said, I am recording this, so if you happen to be watching this video, there's going to be a number of items that are going to be lost on you in terms of demonstrations because you won't be able to see what we're talking about. This unit is called forces and fields, and that means that it deals with, well, it deals specifically with two types of forces and fields. It deals with electric forces and fields, and it deals with magnetic forces and fields. So the behavior that you're looking at here with this poor cat, with all the balloons clinging to the cat, has something to do with electric forces and fields. Although Wile E. Coyote is a fictionalized character, what's happening to Wile E. Coyote here is explained best by talking about magnetic forces and fields. He's got a big magnet strapped to him. Clearly, there's either another magnet someplace in front of him, or there's a big piece of iron that the magnet is attracted to. We're going to start today by looking at electrostatics, charging and the laws of electrostatics. And there's a lot of conceptual material in here. And we're learning all of these things because, quite frankly, you may be asked them on an exam. You might be asked, what is an insulator? What is a conductor? You might be asked, during charging by friction, what are the particles that get transferred? But you're at, you're, we're learning this for a bigger reason. And the bigger reason is, if you understand all of these concepts, so this is actually page one of your unit handout. If you understand all of these concepts, you'll be able to explain electrical interactions, which is the third bullet up here. So we're going to start off by talking about electrical insulators and conductors. Then we're going to discuss three different methods of charging and whether we get to the third one, which is induction today, or we do it tomorrow, remains to be seen. And then we want to just, in general, explain electrical interactions. So the three laws of electrostatics are fairly basic. It says that there's two types of charge. So I, I'm at an advantage here because you've already talked about charge in some of the other lessons. Charge is the property that matter has that produces electrical phenomenon. Mass, on the other hand, is the property of matter that produces gravitational phenomenon. And I would say that as we get deeper and deeper into this unit, you need to really listen carefully to the words. You know, electrical versus gravitational, field versus force. All of these things are subtly different. So to produce gravity or gravitational effects, you need mass. Most objects have mass. Certainly everything around us has mass. But there are some particles in the universe that are massless, which is a little bit of a mind bender. There's some things out there that have no mass. We just have to deal with it. There's another property of matter. And to try to explain to you what charge is is a little more difficult than explaining what mass is because you grow up experiencing mass, right? I mean, you get hit in the head with a baseball, you know there's a mass there. Charge is a little bit different. Anyway, that property of matter, which, is, which we've called charge, has two types. And you know, I hope you understand something here, that if I have a negatively charged object, it's not negative because the universe has painted a negative symbol on there. The positive and the negative are just words that we use to classify the two different types of charge. Similarly charged objects will repel. So if I take a positively charged object and a positively charged object and I put them next to each other, they will push away from each other. And by the way, they will push away from each other with what we call the Coulomb force, the KQQ over R squared. On the other hand, oppositely charged objects will experience an attractive force. So if I have a positively charged object and a negatively charged object, they're going to pull together. Each object forces the other object towards itself. So some questions here. And these are really basic questions that you probably know the answers to, but we're going to use the answers to 
elevate our understanding to a higher level. All matter is composed of a combination of three, what I'm going to call fundamental particles. And that sentence, all matter is composed of three fundamental particles, is chock full of at least two lies. But I'm going to be telling you this again and again throughout the course. I'll be telling you something and then saying, well, consider that true until I tell you otherwise, because later on we'll find out there's more fundamental particles. And later on, we'll discover that not all matter is composed of these fundamental particles. It's more complicated than that. But in junior high and elementary science, and even in science 10, you're taught that everything is made up of these three particles. What are the three particles? You know? Uh, proton, electron, and neutron. Proton, neutron, and electron. Now, hmm. You even said them in the right order. Not that there's a wrong order, but that's the order that I have them here. So a proton is a fundamental particle, a neutron is a fundamental particle, an electron is a fundamental particle. The lie, everybody, the lie is that a proton and a neutron are not truly fundamental. They're made up of smaller pieces. Okay? Whereas an electron is truly fundamental. You take an electron, you smash it with a hammer, figuratively speaking, you can't break it into smaller pieces. But you can do that with a proton, and you can do that with a neutron. We don't need to worry about that today, but it's going to come up again right at the end of the course. When I say all matter is composed of this, what I'm saying is when you look around the room at anything, and I'm fascinated by this, anything, everything is made up of these things. Your calculator is made up of these three ingredients. That's it. They're put together in a certain way that makes the calculator do what it does. Your brain is made up of these three ingredients. And it's just how they're put together that causes your brain to behave a certain way. What are the charges? Well, the proton we need to know is positive, a neutron is neutral, and an electron is negative. And I apologize for some of the stuff up here, but I walked around the room and I think no matter where you're seated, you could see one of the screens enough to write the material down. I think that's pretty easy to remember, although if you look at your formula sheet, the information is there. Right? If you look under the fundamental particles chart on your formula sheet, beside electron it says the charge is negative 1e, so it's telling you it's negative. Uh, beside the neutron, the charge, I, I haven't even really looked. I'm assuming it says zero beside the neutron, and beside the electron or proton it says it's positive. Um, I, I want to point out something about these particles, though, and that's that the proton and the neutron are quite massive. I mean, massive is a relative word. They're microscopic. You can't see them. Even with a regular microscope, you can't see them. But the electron is very tiny compared to them, very tiny. And you could go to your formula sheet and look at the mass of a proton and compare it to the mass of an electron, they're on there, those numbers. If you divide the bigger by the smaller, you get about 1,800. So a neutron is about 1,800 times as massive as an electron, and a proton is about 1,800 times as massive as an electron. When you look at the masses of the proton and the neutron on your formula sheet, and you can take a look now if you like, they are the same. You're told that the mass of a proton and the mass of a neutron are each 1.67 multiplied by 10 to the negative 27. Did I get that right? It's been five months since I've used that. They're not exactly the same. The neutron is a little bit more massive than the proton. You don't need to know that now. Where are these located? When we start saying that all atoms are composed of combinations of th these things, so if I take a look at a, a sodium atom, a typical sodium atom might have 11 protons, it might have 12 neutrons, and it's going to have 11 electrons. Don't worry about those numbers. But where are all of these particles in a sodium atom? The proton and the neutron are welded together in the nucleus with an incredibly strong force. Even though the protons in the nucleus will push away from each other because of an electric force, there's something called a nuclear force which pulls them in and keeps them intact as a single unit, as a nucleus. And that force is gargantuan. Okay? It's, it's 
incomprehensible right now to us. The electron, on the other hand, they are orbiting the nucleus at very large distances. And as massive as the proton and neutron are, the nucleus, when they come together, the nucleus is really, really tiny. And this is where we get the idea of atoms and matter being mostly empty space. If I look at a very primitive diagram of an atom, there's a nucleus that's got protons and neutrons in it. And there are tiny electrons orbiting at vast distances. So you know, you probably can't see. Well, I don't know. Your eyes are better than mine. But this actually has a whole bunch of different pieces to it. If I enlarge this a bit, this is what we're talking about. The nucleus is down on the bottom left. And there's an electron in some orbit that's very far away. So most of this atom is nothing. Right? But most of matter is nothing. However, <laughs> you know, that doesn't mean I can just poke my finger right through everything. And the reason I can't, and this gets pretty weird to think about, is those electrons are zipping around the atom so fast that when I go to touch this or push it, the electrons zipping around the atoms in my fingertip and the electrons zipping around the atoms in the thermos push away from each other. And that's why that happens. It's a repulsive force between the electrons in the atoms in my finger and the electrons in the atoms in the thermos. They never actually make contact with each other. I'm bringing this up because anything that involves charge, and just without explaining the details of it, you understand that if I am in my house on a carpet and I'm wearing socks and I shuffle my feet across the carpet and then I go up to my dog who's sleeping and I touch my dog's nose and there's that spark. You understand that has something to do with charge. Okay? Well, the charge that is involved in those interactions has to be electrons because the electrons are on the outer part of the atom. They're the ones that we can grab. And they're held to atoms not that tightly, generally speaking. I cannot do anything to the carpet and my socks to try to move, remove protons from the atoms. It's impossible. Because this force holding the nucleus together is too big. OK. So I, I just put this up here. Because I, I do. I think this is fascinating. If I was like the cosmic chef of the universe, you know, I go in my pantry in my kitchen and I have like baking powder and baking soda and salt and sugar and I have, I go to the fridge and I have all this stuff, right? But if you were like the cosmic chef, you would only need three ingredients, right? I want to go home tonight. I want to have a beer, steak, and lobster. I open up the electron cupboard. I open up the neutron cupboard. I open up the proton cupboard. If I could put them together in the right way, supper's ready. Of course, that's only in Star Trek, right? So far, I'm, I'm holding out hope. To give you an idea here of the magnitude of the forces involved, the nuclear force, that number is not exactly right, but the nuclear force compared to the electric force is very, very large. When you compare the electric force holding an electron to a nucleus, to the nuclear force holding the nucleons, all the protons and neutrons together, that electric force is puny. That nuclear force is huge. Again, I'm saying this to reinforce to you that when we have electrical interactions out here, like rubbing a balloon on your hair, it's going to involve electrons, not protons. All right. Um, well, I didn't erase that. Number two says an electrical insulator is one in which electrons are not allowed to flow easily. So be very careful, OK? Electrical insulators are materials where the electrons cannot flow through them. That doesn't mean I can't pack electrons onto an insulator. I can. It's just that they can't flow through them. So for example, if we had a power line, and that power line is suspended between two poles, and the power line happens to be negatively charged, 
that means that that, and this has the, the wire, by the way, as a conductor, and that's not my point. This is packed with electrons. Okay. If I decide to walk under here, and I'm carrying here's my hat, and I'm carrying a copper pipe over my shoulder, and I touch that power line, the copper pipe is a good conductor. It allows electrons to flow very easily through it. And what's going to happen is those electrons up here, which are all pushing away from each other, will end up being pushed onto the pipe and then into the ground. Whereas if I was carrying a piece of wood, I, look, I'm not saying you should take a piece of wood and touch a power line, okay? I'm not saying do that. But I'm saying if the wood were really, really dry, you'd probably be okay because the wood is a good insulator. So the key idea here between conductors and insulators is not whether or not they can keep a charge, but whether they will allow charge to flow through them. So things that are conductors are generally speaking metals, although there are some non-metals like carbon. Well, I'm assuming in chemistry you learned about the staircase on the periodic table and the fact that the non-metals are to the right of it and the, metal, the metals are to the left. Hydrogen's kind of a weird one. But along the staircase are what we call metalloids. Well, those are generally speaking good conductors as well. But we don't need to worry about that here. Insulators are things like plastics, synthetic materials, uh, latex, rubber, Cloth, I guess, would be considered a pretty good insulator. But when we talk about insulators and conductors, we're usually talking about solid materials. Um, any questions with what an insulator is or a conductor is? Yeah? You said you can pack electrons onto an insulator? Yes. We will, we will, I will show you that in a second. I mention that because when I show you that in a bit, some people are going to go, wait a minute, he's holding an insulator and he's got electrons on it. I thought an insulator didn't allow electrons. No, an insulator doesn't allow electrons to flow through it, but I can put the electrons on it. Okay, and, and we'll get to how that happens in just a second. So, oh, we've got the same diagram from last time I taught this. If you were to go to page 514 of your textbook, and you certainly don't have to do that now, I hope you understand that it isn't just that something is a conductor or an insulator. Some materials are good conductors. Some materials are excellent conductors. So this is a table of conductivity. So things like silver and copper and aluminum have a very high conductivity. This number is just a relative number. It's saying that if silver has a conductivity of 10 to the 8, and wood has a conductivity of 10 to the negative 10, then silver is 10 to the 18 times as conductive. So if I try to allow electrons to flow through a piece of silver, I will get 10 to the 18 times as many electrons doing that as I would if I tried it with wood, generally speaking. All right, now we're going to look at charging. Charging by friction is one of the I guess, most prevalent methods of charging objects. It's the method of charging that explains why we get lightning. It's the method of charging that explains why when I shuffle across the carpet in my socks, I can cause a little lightning bolt to move from my fingertip to my dog's nose. It's why um, I remember in my third year teaching, I came to school and I taught all day and all the teachers and all the students were laughing at me because I had a sock stuck to the back of my pant leg. And that was caused by friction. I guess I didn't have any bounce sheets or fabric softener that day. What happens in charging is you take two, the materials must be different. You cannot take a piece of animal fur and an identical type of animal fur and rub them together and expect to get any charge. Okay, they have to be different materials. And I'm going to make the point, and this is hinging on what Ian and I were just talking about. When you charge objects, it's most likely that you're going to be insulators. I'm not saying you can't charge a conductor. I'm just saying it requires a little bit of ingenuity. So you take two different insulators or materials and you rub them together. And what happens is that physical action of rubbing them together removes electrons from the outer atoms. 
it's hard to imagine. I mean, we can't really see it, but the electrons in one object and the electrons in the other object are banging back and forth against each other, and they get loosened from the atoms. And it, during that rubbing action, there's a layer of electrons that are just not owned by any particular atom. They're just kind of drifting around. And what happens is one of the materials has a greater attraction for those electrons than another. And I know that some of you are going to want to know why. Why is it, for example, that when I rub um, kitten fur, I'm just it's not kitten, it's bunny fur. When I rub bunny fur with this black plastic, why is it the black plastic has a greater attraction for electrons? And I know that some of you will wonder that. And I can't answer that other than to say that's just the way the atoms are put together. That's like asking me why a banana is yellow. It's yellow because the atoms are put together in a certain way so that it reflects yellow light. Okay. So what happens here when you rub the two materials together is there's a transfer of electrons from one material to the other. And it will transfer to the material that has a greater attraction for electrons. Now, this is the weird thing about this. I can do this and say, see, it's negative, and this is positive. But you don't, I mean, I could just be making up stories, right? So we're going to need a way to find evidence of this charge, and we'll get there in a minute. The result is that after the charging, the two objects will be oppositely charged, but they will have an equal amount of charge. And the reason is, the reason why the, char the object that becomes negative is negative is it has stolen electrons from the other object. And that means the object that's positive is missing electrons. And the number of extra electrons the negative object ends up having is the same as the number of missing electrons the positive object ends up having missing. So because of conservation of charge, what you're dealing with is equal but opposite charges. So if I take a comb and I take this poor little kitten and I start rubbing the comb, the comb is plastic, the kitten is fur, what happens is afterwards the kitten is negative. And by the way, uh, sorry, the kitten is positive. The comb becomes negative. By the way, the kitten's fur will stand up because all of the strands of fur on the kitten's head are positive. They're all missing electrons. But similar charges repel. So the end result is those that fur stands out. Okay. Um, there's extra electrons on the comb. There's missing electrons on the cap. When I was about 10 years old, me and my buddy Steve Budinsky, we called it Static Hill. There was a hill in Clairview in Edmonton. I've been back there, it's not really that big of a hill, but it seemed big at the time when I was 10. And when it was really stormy out but not raining, we used to go up on top of the hill because our hair would stand up. We had long hair back then. Well, we weren't scientifically very smart because we were asking for trouble. The reason our hair was standing up is we were building up a charge somehow. And we could have been hit by lightning quite easily. So if you're ever outside and your hair starts standing up, don't laugh, just get out of there, okay? Um, this is Scout. She's a tiny, tiny little dog. She looks big there, but she's tiny. And she moves really fast. Like, I'm amazed I can get a picture of her like that. Uh, this is what the pictures very often look like. Like, she's just a blur. Uh, Sometimes you're not even sure. It's like you're taking a picture of Sasquatch or something. It's so blurry. But I took this picture um, last summer, summer before. I don't remember. It was really dry out. There was a lot of static in my house. And she was running around, and she stopped. And that's what her tail looked like afterwards. And that isn't just because it's dirty or anything. That's the static. That's the fact that the friction between her and the carpet and the floor and everything else probably removed electrons from her, and she was positively charged. Okay. And this is, uh, I have lots of pictures of former students. This is a former student. This is after the student, she's standing on a milk crate so that she's not touching the ground. And we turn on a Van de Graaff generator. You guys know what a Van de Graaff generator is? If you look in the back cupboard, and we'll take one out tomorrow. Uh, if we look in the back cupboard, 
there's a couple in there. They're just a big metal dome with a belt that charges the dome negative. You touch that dome and you become negative because the electrons on the dome push away from each other and they, they have more room over on you, so they go to you. But once the electrons go to you, they push away from each other as far away as they can, causing uh, Aaliyah's hair to be negatively charged. So this is, she's taken her hands off the Van de Graaff generator at this point, but she's still negatively charged until she touches the floor and then she'll lose the charge. So we have some questions now. Ebonite plastic, this is a, a type of plastic, it's a, a black colored plastic, it's called ebonite, that you'll often see in exam questions. It has a greater attraction to electrons than animal fur. So if I rub the two together, what happens? After the rubbing, the charge on the rod will be negative, and there's not much for me to write or explain here other than the verbal explanation. The charge on the rod is going to be negative because we're told it has a greater attraction for electrons than the fur. So in this action of rubbing this together, and again, I, I mean, I could just be lying to you. Maybe nothing's happening. I'm not. This becomes negative. This becomes positive. This becomes negative because it's pulled electrons off of the fur. So after the rubbing, the charge on the rod is negative, and the charge on the fur is positive. This is, uh, I'm sorry to say, this is such a simple question, I don't think it would make it onto an exam. This is a very fundamental idea. Questions with three? Yeah. Are we changing the structure of the abundance? No. What we are doing is we are causing atoms to become ions. So if there is such a thing as a bunny fur atom, and the atom in a bunny fur, uh, the, yeah, the atom of bunny fur has 48 electrons in it, then maybe some of these atoms only have 46 electrons or 45 electrons. And what determines, I don't want to get too far afield here, but when you look at the periodic table on the left side of the room, and you will get one as part of your data package for exams, what makes a particular atom what it is has nothing to do with electrons. It has to do with number of protons. So the reason why a sodium atom is a sodium atom, or the reason why it's sodium, I'll just say that, is there are 11 protons in it. And whether, if there happen to also be 11 electrons, then it's an atom. But if it has fewer electrons, then it just is an ion, but it's still sodium. So it's still bunny fur, it's just ionized bunny fur. You understand there's no such thing as bunny atoms. They're bunny molecules. OK. Uh, number four, what is the magnitude of the charge of the fur in comparison to the magnitude of the charge on uh, the rod? Well, they will be equal in magnitude. And the word magnitude simply means how many coulombs of charge. But they will be opposite in character. You'll see the word character to indicate positive versus negative. What's the character of the charge? It's positive. What's the magnitude? Three microcoulombs. Okay. So equal but opposite in character to the charge on the rod. So the answer to this is A. Again, just testing the fundamentals. This is a little bit more of an application question. You're told that when glass and silk are rubbed together, the glass becomes positive. And then you're told if you rub silk with copper, the copper becomes negative. And you're asked to rank these materials in increasing attractiveness to electrons. So we want to list the material that has the weakest attraction for electrons up to the material that has the greatest attraction. Well, the first sentence says, when glass and silk, when glass and silk are rubbed together, the glass becomes positive, which must mean the silk becomes negative, which means the silk is more attracted to electrons than the glass. So if I make a table here, and I, I put at the top greatest attraction to electrons, glass, I got to read this again, glass and silk are rubbed together. The glass becomes positive. So the silk must become negative, And that means the silk has a greater attraction than the glass. It's tricky, because even after I say that, I'm going to read it again and think about it again. 
If the glass is positive, the silk becomes negative. The reason the silk becomes negative is it steals the electrons from the glass, so the silk has a greater attraction to electrons. Uh, when silk is rubbed with copper, the copper becomes negative. Oh, well, wow, wait a minute. That means that copper has an even greater attraction to electrons than silk. So we put copper up here. And now we can list them as glass, silk, to copper. So two, three, and one. Does that make sense? Any questions with that? So there is a, a similar, this is not a conductivity table, but if you were to go to, I believe, page 518 of your textbook, there's something, I don't know, this is a weird word, triboelectric series. And it's simply what we just constructed in this question, but somebody has experimentally done it for a variety of materials. And you might see exam questions where in the box that says use the following information, you're given a triboelectric series. Okay, now we're going to talk about an electroscope. So I, I, I know it goes to question six, but I want you to turn the page because it was the best place for me to print it in your handout. We're going to talk about what's called an electroscope. And an electroscope is a device that, among other things, detects the presence of charge. Okay? So this electroscope you're looking at in your handout, it has a, a box. It has a metal shaft and a metal sphere. And this is all, all of this material other than the box is conductive. And then it's got a little metal U-shaped hook and hanging from that hook are two metal pieces of foil. Okay? And those two metal pieces of foil can move. This electroscope that you're looking at, the picture on the right, is pretty much what you're looking at in your handout. It's called a leaf electroscope or a gold leaf electroscope. And you might be able to see what we're talking about here with those gold leaves just hanging there. There's just a couple of little holes and they're hanging on those hooks. And I have one here. I don't want to move it around too much, but if I kind of shake it, you can see the leaves move. Right? And I know it's far away, but I think you get the idea. There's this other thing called a straw electroscope. Straw electroscopes are very, very good, but they are quite finicky. What you're looking at here, instead of a metal sphere at the top, we have a metal plate, and that's this electroscope right up here. And then there's a shaft, and the shaft, this is connected to the shaft, and the shaft comes down like that. Okay. The, the circle here is insulated from everything else just like the metal box here is insulated from everything else. You know, on this electroscope at the top, there's a rubber stopper holding this in. And balanced with a needle on a little pivot point is a straw. It's actually a drinking straw. You cut a little piece and you put it in there. I don't want to move it, but it will move. I don't want to move it because it will fall off if I touch it. It's very delicate. Okay? So that's what an electroscope is. Let's go back to question, you know what, let's do question seven first. If a negatively charged rod is brought close to a neutral electroscope, what will the leaves do? So you are going to have to trust me here just for the time being. That this is negatively charged, okay? I can't prove it to you right now, but we will get there. If I bring a negatively charged rod close to the top of this electroscope, since the sphere is a conductive material, electrons in the sphere, which can move around in here because it's a conductor, will be repelled from the rod. And electrons in the sphere will go far away from the rod. And they will move down towards the leaves. So what should happen? is when I bring this negatively charged object close to the electroscope, electrons in the electroscope, many of them will move towards the leaves. The electroscope will still be neutral. But the top of the electroscope is going to be missing electrons, and the bottom will have extra electrons. If I push these electrons down to the bottom, the leaves become negative, and they will repel. 
So what should happen is that. Okay? And I will do that. So I, we'll just do it in stages here. I'll do it for this part of the room first. If I bring it close, you can see that the leaves move away from each other. By the way, now that you know about Coulomb's law, they move away from each other, but if I go even closer, they move further away from each other because if this becomes closer to the electrons, the electrons are forced more and they move more to the bottom, just towards the center of the room. It's not like some fascinating thing, but you need to see it. And this is what I mean by charging an insulator. What I've done when I do this is I've packed a whole bunch of extra electrons right there on that area that I've rubbed. If I tried this with a piece of metal, those electrons would push away from each other and leave and go into me. I wouldn't be able to charge it. So the answer to this question The answer to this question is, electrons in the electroscope would be forced to the bottom, making both leaves negative. That's why the leaves will repel. And now I have to, there's, I've never found an easy way in over 30 years of teaching this to make it all seamless. I have to kind of jump around. I'm going to actually charge this thing. This is a pith ball, okay? And all a pith ball, P-I-T-H, all a pith ball is what time does this class end? 10.30? 10.40. All a pith ball is is a tiny styrofoam ball, and this one happens to be painted with a graphite paint. And graphite is a good conductor. And I'm going to charge the pith ball negative. And I'm going to do so by touching the negative rod to the pith ball. And this is actually conduction, and we don't need to worry about it, but I just want to do this. Okay, so the pith ball is charged negative now. And you can tell it's negative. And you have to accept that this is negative, not positive. You can tell it's negative because the pith ball is repelled from the rod. Are you with me on that? Okay. And it danced around a bit. We will explain that later. Okay. It's negative. So now I'm going to look at question eight. Question eight says, what happens if you bring a positively charged object a positively charged object close to a neutral electroscope. Well, look, in theory, I should be able to rub glass with silk and get a positive rod. But you get so little positive charge that I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use a different source for a positive. I'm going to use this thing right here. And we will explain this. There's a lot going on right now, but we will explain why what I'm about to show you will work. If I rub this metal plate Sorry, if I rub the styrofoam with the fur and then I put the plate on top and touch the plate and lift the plate off, this plate is positive. I'm not going to explain why right now. This plate is positive. And I can prove to you it's positive because this pith ball is negative, right? And it's attracted. So whatever happened here makes this positive. By the way, if I touch this, it's no longer positive. It's neutral. Uh, it's got a bit of charge left. But I can always get more charge by putting it back on, touching it, and lifting it up. So this is positive. So what's going to happen to the electroscope when I bring the positively charged object close to the electroscope? Well, the leaves are going to repel. I can show that to you over here. I bring this close. Didn't really get a lot of positive charge. Ouch. They repel a little bit. Okay. So one of the things I want to impress on you, and I'm going to get a different positive charge. This isn't working very well right now, so I'm going to grab a different one. And this is why we do this in two days, because it, things never really necessarily go to plan. So let's take a break from this question for a second, and let's talk about this thing. Okay, this is called a Wimshurst machine. I have one over here as well. This is an old one, and the handle broke off, and we bought a new one. 
which is this one. When you crank this, what happens is through friction, one of these spheres becomes positive and one becomes negative. Okay? And if you crank it enough, the one that becomes negative becomes so negative that all the electrons on it jump over to the positive and you see a spark. Okay? Okay? And this is the new one. I thought I was really excited. We bought a new one. This is the old one. which is much better, okay? I know. So, if you look down here, this says negative and this says positive. So I've already worked out which is which. So when I crank this, it's pumping electrons from this side to the other side. This sphere on your left is negative, the sphere on your right is positive. So if I want some positive charge, I can take this and I can touch it to the positive terminal. And this is going to be positive. Now this is going to become positive because if that terminal right here is positive, then it's going to steal electrons from this. This is now missing electrons and it's positive. And I can prove it's positive because I may have to charge that again. Let me charge the pith ball negative again. That's not bad. That's better. So the pith ball is negative. You can see that it's attracted to this. So this is positive. Okay? And I don't want to get too close because I don't want them to touch. So when I bring this close to the electroscope, just not getting enough positive charge here. It was better with this. When I bring a positively charged object close to the electroscope, can you see the leaves repelling a little bit? Okay. So one of the things I want to point out to you is that the leaves repel whether I bring a positively charged object close or a negatively charged object. You cannot decide whether an object is positive or negative by bringing it close to an electroscope. All you can do is say it's charged. And the reason the leaves repel is that the positively charged object is going to draw electrons towards the top of the electroscope, moving electrons away from the leaves, making the leaves negative, and the negatives will repel. Uh, sorry, making the leaves positive because we're removing electrons away from them. So electrons will be forced to the top, making both leaves positive. So the correct answer is C. You cannot move protons. So anytime you have a question like this on an exam, protons do not move. It's important for you to remember that. Okay. By the way, I will just show you briefly now the straw electroscope in case you see it on an exam. See, it's already popped off of there. Like it's so delicately balanced. I'm going to use the negatively charged rod for this. You see it? The, the reason why a straw electroscope is maybe preferable is that it's got numbers on the back that you can read the angle that it's deflected at. Right. Um, I'm not going to do six, actually. There's a problem with number six. I'm going to leave it alone. So let's take a look now at number nine. As an, This is going to require a lot of thought. We have an initially negatively charged electroscope. So how do I get a, a negatively charged electroscope? I do that. Is it deflected right now? That's because what I've done is I've touched a negatively charged object to it, and as a result, I've transferred electrons to it. Now we'll charge this one for this side of the room.
and the leaves stay in that state. So now it says, as I bring a negatively charged rod closer to this already negative electroscope, what should happen? Well, the leaves are repelling right now because they're negative. The whole electroscope is negative. If I bring a negatively charged rod close to the top of the electroscope, it's going to push even more electrons down to the bottom. So the leaves should repel more. And the straw should deflect more. Is the straw still deflected? Right? Can you see it from there? Okay. Uh, this one is a little more delicate. I have to go in front to see if it's going to work. Yeah. And if, you'll have to trust me on the left side to see the right side. And uh, we can play around with this a bit later. So they're going to repel further. It's going to be either A or B. What if I bring a positively charged object close? Not having a lot of luck with my positively charged object. I'm going to stick with this thing. And again, we, are, we know that this is positive because it attracts the negative pith ball, right? And we know the pith ball is negative because I touched it with a negatively charged rod. And we know the rod was negative because when you rub the fur with the plastic, the plastic becomes negative. Okay. The reason why the leaves are spread apart right now on the electroscope is they are negatively charged because they have a whole bunch of extra electrons there. If I bring a positively charged object close to the electroscope, close to the top, it will draw electrons towards the top. Now, the leaves will still contain lots of extra electrons, but they will contain less. So the leaves should start to repel less. And I. I hope you can appreciate it. I don't want to go too close, because if I go too close, there'll be a spark. And that will be a transfer of charge, which is not what we're talking about. So the leaves collapse a bit. Does the straw collapse a bit? It does. Okay. So the correct answer is repel further and repel less. Is this making sense to you so far? OK, good. How do we charge by conduction? Well, this is what I meant by. There's not a nice linear way to teach this. Every time I teach it, I find I have to do a bit at a time from different areas. I've already explained to you charging by conduction. This neutral pith ball, so it's neutral right now. This, don't worry about why I'm doing this, okay? This neutral rod, there's no interaction. They're both neutral. We know that if I charge, this is always the starting point. If I charge this rod by rubbing it with rabbit fur, the rod becomes negative. That's a neutral object. So if I touch this, we've talked about this in class, when you touch two objects together, they share the charge. So since the charge was negative, it's shared. Now listen very carefully. Remember when we take two charges and we add them together and then divide by two? You can't do that here because this is a different shape and material than that. If I touch two metal spheres that are identical together, that would happen. But now what I've done is I've charged the pith ball by conduction using a negatively charged object. And after the charging, they are the same charge. Okay. So when you charge by conduction, you must start with a charged object, which you probably get by friction. You touch that charged object to another object. In this case, it's neutral. And some of the charge on the charged object goes to the other object. So specifically, let's just use a number like if there was 100 microcoulombs of negative charge on here, and I touch this, maybe afterwards there's 75 microcoulombs of negative charge left, and there's negative 25 on there. So what's happened is some of the electrons that I've packed on here by rubbing with the fur, get transferred to the pith ball. Okay. What if, and this is more difficult to explain. It's a lot more difficult to explain for me or for you. What if I start off with a neutral pith ball and I use a positively charged object? And again, I, I know I get overly repetitive, but I've already demonstrated to you that when I do that, for whatever reason, 
this is positive because I've shown you that if I bring it to a negative pith ball, the pith ball is attracted. So this is positive. If I touch a positive object, which is still a charged object, to a neutral pith ball, it's repelled afterwards, which means I've transferred charge. But here's where things get iffy. They're both positive now. And it's OK, I guess, to say I've transferred positive charge to the pith ball, but that's not really what's happened. I've taken electrons away from the pith ball because positive charge doesn't move. So if you want to get very subtle about it, the reason why they're both positive is not because positive charge was transferred, but because negative charge went away. Afterwards, they will be similarly charged. When you charge anything by conduction, it doesn't matter whether one was neutral or they were both charged to begin with, afterwards they will have the same charge. And if the objects were the same material, same size, etc., then they're going to have the same charge. Okay. Any questions about conduction? Okay, number 10. When a negatively charged rod touches an initially neutral electroscope, the electroscope will become negative. Because, and I can put the electroscopes back up here, but when you have an electroscope that's neutral, it contains some conductive piece to it. If I touch that with a negatively charged object, Think, think very carefully about this. I've just packed on gajillions of electrons on this spot where I was charging by rubbing. And those electrons are all pushed away from each other on this rod. But they don't move anywhere because the rod is an insulator. However, if I open a door for them, I touch that pile of electrons to something where they can move off onto a good conductor, the electroscope becomes negative. Okay. Do the same thing here. I don't know if the straw has popped off or not. No, it's still OK. So what's actually happening, I can show this to you up here with the straw electroscope, is that green line becomes negative, the straw becomes negative, and the ends of the straw push away from the green. Okay. So the answer to number 10. Uh, the electroscope will become negative because electrons are added to the electroscope. And again, fairly basic kind of question. 11, when a positively charged rod touches an initially neutral electroscope, the electroscope will become, well, positive because that's what happens with conduction. It's going to become positive because electrons are removed from the electroscope. I'm going to give... Uh, I'm going to give it a shot trying to rub a silk material to a glass rod. Silk rubbed with glass should give positive to glass. But I, I'm not usually, generally speaking, did it go back to its resting state? I'm not usually very successful in getting a positive charge in this method, but I want to try it. Maybe wool might be better. Yeah, I can't, I can't really get a positive charge. Uh, let's do this again. And you, I will explain to you why this is positive after I do this. When I touch it, when I touch it, did it go? Okay. So the straw has been deflected. And the electroscope with the leaves has been deflected. Okay. Any questions with 11? Okay, number 12, a metal sphere is on an insulated stand. The sphere is given a charge of negative 50 microcoulombs. And you bring it into contact with an identical sphere. I think you know how to answer this question because we did this in the Coulomb's Law lesson. After you touch and separate these, what will the charge on each sphere be? 25, it would be half of the total, right? 
So it'll be 20, negative 25 microcoulombs. Metal sphere is on an insulating stand. If you have a charge of negative 30 microcoulombs and you touch it to a positive 120 microcoulomb charge, what will the charge be afterwards? Well, you're going to add these numbers together. and gets 90, positive 90 microcoulombs. So that means each one will be positive 45, half of that. We are assuming here, and the only reason this will work, is the spheres are identical. Not identical in charge, but they're identical in shape, size, and material. I, I hope it's obvious. I don't know if I have a question here like this. But if I had this sphere with a charge of negative 50 microcoulombs, and I touch it to this sphere that is neutral, that afterwards it will not be 25-25. It'll probably be negative 49, negative 1. Because what happens when these objects come into contact with each other is they become one object. So those electrons that make up the charge spread out as much as possible. And there's more room on the larger sphere so the larger sphere gets more charge. OK, let's talk about grounding. When a charged object is connected to the Earth, like I literally mean the Earth, you ground it. And what that means is it becomes neutral. If I have, now this electroscope is charged positive from the metal plate. This electroscope is charged positive. Yes, still, still charged from the metal plate. If I touch this, then I'm connecting it to the Earth because I'm somewhat electrically conductive. And really, I didn't talk about this for no reason. I'm taking this charged object and touching it to the Earth. So what I'm doing is taking this object that can't make it any smaller and touching it to the Earth. Does this object, this little tiny object, get to keep any of its charge? It's immeasurable. The Earth is so large that it will steal all of the charge. Now, we have a little bit of a problem here. If I go back now to a negatively charged electroscope, negatively charged, negatively charged, it's very easy to explain why this grounds it. I, which I'm connected to the Earth, steal all of the extra electrons from the electroscope. Is it back in its resting state? It's very easy to explain here the same thing. I'm stealing all of the electrons. But if I charge something positive, if I charge something positive, It's more difficult to explain why touching it grounds it. When I touch this positive object, I'm, loosely speaking, removing the positive charge from it. But really what's happening is it's stealing electrons from me and the Earth to balance out. I, I just don't want you to think that there's positive. When I do this, I don't want you to think there's positive charge that left here and went into the Earth. What's happened is positive charge, since it doesn't move, What's happened is negative charges come from the Earth to do that. And same thing here. Okay. When you look at an electrical outlet, now uh, alternating current is a little bit more complicated than what I'm going to show you. But when you look at a, an outlet, and it's got the two outlets here, uh, and again, this is a bit of a lie because it's alternating current. Think of one of these lines as being positive, one as being negative. It's not really. It switches back and forth very rapidly. But this is the ground. And literally speaking, if you follow that wire from behind the receptacles through the walls, it will go to a circuit box, breaker box. Okay? 
and all of those ground wires in the breaker box will go to a single location, a single post. And if you follow that, which will be a very thick copper wire, if you follow that, and I'm not lying, literally, it will be connected to a piece of metal that's driven into the earth. Someplace in the building, now it could be, it could be a metal pipe, right? If you go home and you look in your basement, what would be a good example? At your hot water tank, there should be a ground wire coming off of there somewhere. And it's probably clamped, unless you have a finished basement, it's probably clamped to a gas pipe because the pipe goes into the ground. That may seem dangerous, you're attaching electricity to gas, but it doesn't matter because it's grounded. It's going to go into the ground. So if the object was negative, the XX electrons will move into the ground. If the object was positive, electrons will leave the ground, canceling out. You said 1140 or 1040? 1040, okay. Um, this is why you can see on a power line, and the power line can be bare wire, you can see, this ought to be good, You can see mutated crows sitting on the power line. And they're fine. Because they're not grounded, this negatively charged wire, and it could be positive instead, there's no place for those electrons to go. However, when you look over on the pole, you will see very often on many poles transformers. And they have a wire here and a wire there. And the transformers at the top have a voltage. What that means is one of those posts is positive and one's negative, basically. Okay? I'm oversimplifying things. And every now and then, then the transformer will blow. There'll be a big puff of smoke, there'll be a large bang, and the neighborhood will be without power for a while. Okay? And you can find. I don't know why people sit around and film these things, but people film transformers waiting for a squirrel or something to go on it and see what happens. You can go on YouTube and check it out, if that's your gig. So when the knob of a positively charged electroscope is touched with a metal rod, what will the leaves do? And when it's charged with a glass rod, what will it do? Well, let's find out. Let's take a positively charged object. Charge this electroscope positive. Charge this electroscope positive. Yes? Okay. Yes, over here. Okay. So the question is what happens when you touch the electroscope with a metal rod, and what happens when you touch it with a glass rod? This is glass. I won't do it yet. I'll see if you can figure it out. Any ideas? Yeah. If you put it in a charge on the glass one, you get extra power for the glass one. I want to be careful with your language. You're, we're almost there. But it's not that we can't get a charge on here. And, and I hope you're not saying that because I, I, I was unsuccessful in charging this with friction. Okay? I was just unsuccessful in charging this with friction because uh, the conditions aren't right. And they never appear to be. Okay. I could, change, I could change the glass to wood. I don't care what these materials, well, I do care what they are, but let's use wood instead of glass. I can charge this with friction. So it isn't that this doesn't get a charge. By the way, the answer is when I touch it with the glass or the wood, essentially nothing happens. Okay, I'm going to go back to the glass. But why? Why? When I touch the electroscope with the glass, does nothing happen? Right, nothing happened there. But if I touch it with the metal, did it collapse? Why does that ground it out?
Brody, do you know? That's it. I mean, I'm back to walking under the power line. I'm not saying you want to walk under a power line and touch it with a piece of glass. But you'd be in a lot better shape doing that than touching it with a piece of metal. Because the metal is a good conductor. Doing this, and I'm a pretty good conductor, and I'm connected to the Earth, doing this grounds that electroscope. I might as well, when I do this, I might as well just be waving my hands in the air, because I'm not really touching it electrically. So with the metal rod, the leaves will collapse, but they will continue to repel with the glass. We're still OK? Now I'm going to show you charging by induction. And this is a very delicate process, and this is where we're going to end today. I am going to charge this pith ball, which is neutral. Now I can tell you why I know this is neutral, because I've just grounded it. Whatever the charge might have been on it, there's no more. I'm going to charge it using induction. And this is a very delicate process. I'm going to take a negatively charged rod. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do it with the electroscope. I'm going to charge this electroscope using induction. And I'll do it over here first. I'm going to take the negatively charged rod. We know it's negative, right? The universe didn't change between a half hour ago and now. I'm going to bring it close to the electroscope. Now, I haven't charged the electroscope because the leaves go back down. Now, we'll show this to everybody else in a second. I'm going to bring it close to the electroscope. And then I'm going to touch with my finger the electroscope. Then I'm going to remove my finger and remove this. And it's charged right now, isn't it? Not a great amount, but you can see that the leaves are apart from each other. I'll do the same thing over here. So I take the negatively charged object. I bring it close to the electroscope. Of course, it pushes the leaves apart. I touch the electroscope. I remove my finger, and then I remove the rod. And it's charged. You can see it's charged. Now, what is the charge on it? Well, this is negative, right? So if the charge on this is negative, then when I move this close to the electroscope, the leaf should repel more. But look what happens when I bring it close. The leaves collapse. Which tells you that whatever I did with that negative rod made this positive. So first of all, charging by induction makes something positive. Uh, sorry, I, I, I shouldn't say that. Charging something by induction will charge it opposite to the object you used. Okay. What's going on here? Well, I'm going to explain this in a different way up here. I'm just going to imagine that this is the object we want to charge. It's neutral. This is like the electroscope. And I'm going to bring a negatively charged rod close to it. Now, in this neutral object, which is the electroscope, there are lots of protons. One, two, three, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty. I believe I have twenty-five there. If you're bored, you can count them for me. But let's say that we have twenty-five positive charges in there, and we're going to have a, a heck of a lot more. We also have twenty-five. Ah, come what have we got? Five, six, seven, eight, be patient, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. 
21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Let's just say they're equal. I don't know. You may be wondering why he didn't just write them in, because I want them separate, because those are the electrons, and the electrons can move. So when I bring that negatively charged object close, well, let's just get rid of it for the time being. When that negatively charged object is not there, here's the electroscope in its nice happy state. All the electrons are pushing away from each other. They spread out evenly. I bring that negatively charged object close, and what happens is electrons in the electroscope will shift to the far side because they're repelled. When I touch the electroscope, I'm grounding it. And this is the symbol for an electrical ground. And I know the electroscope's neutral, but when you look at it in pieces, there's a positive half and there's a negative half. And I'm grounding the negative half. So some of these electrons are going to steal away in the night, so to speak, and go into the ground. I then remove my finger, which means I remove the ground. And I've, what I've done, I guess, is I've slammed the door on those electrons. Some electrons have left, and they can't get back in now because I've cut the ground. And now when I remove this, the electrons that are here will spread out evenly, but I've got less of them, so the object is positive. If I were to do the same thing by bringing a positively charged object close to it, then I would be pulling electrons out of the ground, making the neutral object negative. So I'm going to pause there. Does anybody have any questions about this process? Let me show it to you here. You take a charged object that you bring close to a neutral object. You ground the neutral object, allowing electrons to either be forced out of the object or pulled into the object. Then you disconnect the ground and you remove the charging object. You get an opposite charge to what you started off with. Ian. You mean, is the force of grounding I lost it. Is the force of grounding greater than the force of pushing them out or in? It's the same force, really. Okay, so I think I know where you're going with this. When I explained it just using a rectangular block of metal, you don't have that difficulty. I, I, am I thinking what you're thinking? I, on that block, the ground was on the negative side. But yeah. The ground was on the yeah. The, uh, I would say, and I'm not dismissing your question, but just to begin with, that might be a case of overanalyzing things. Think of it this way. When I bring the negatively charged object close to the sphere, not only does it push electrons towards the bottom, it pushes electrons to the far side of the sphere. Is that OK? The thing I want to leave you with is the following. And you want to think about this for tomorrow. I still have a couple of minutes. If I take a neutral pith ball, So there's no charge on anything. The pith ball is neutral. And I charge a rod negative. There's no charge on the pith ball. Why is the neutral pith ball attracted? Give me a second. Why is the neutral pith ball attracted to the negative? I don't want it to touch. Hold on. I think it might have touched. It did. Why is there an attraction to begin with? No, Do you see it jump away? That's because it touched. My question is, why is a neutral object initially attracted?
And you can't say because opposites attract because the charge on the pith ball is not opposite to the charge on the rod. There is no charge on the pith ball. 